Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to dive into our webinar and the content that we have for you today. Um, before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that if you have any questions, please submit them in the area titled questions um, in your widget on your screen there for GoToWebinar. Um, it'll just be myself, Natalie Brownell, who's presenting today. So I will do my best to answer any and all questions at the end of today's webinar. Um, so thank you again for joining us and let's go ahead and dive in. Alrighty, so the topic of today's webinar is I bought a domain name, now what? Today, we're going to cover, obviously, domain names, talk about branding, about website creation, and about domaining or the practice of domain speculation investment. Um, there's a lot that we have to cover today. Uh, so if you would like any additional information on anything we discussed today, please let me know in the chat so that we can cater future webinars and content to your needs and requests. Thank you. Alrighty, so just to give you guys some background on myself um, and let you know what my experience with domains is, I am the content marketing manager for the domain brands at Newfold Digital, including domain.com. Um, today, my goal is to educate you on your post-domain registration options. I'd like to provide some information that maybe isn't super easily found online and not necessarily your traditional prescriptive advice either. Um, so very, very excited for what we have to talk about today. Domain names, um, they hold a world and wealth of potential inside of them. And how that's realized is going to be entirely up to you, whether you decide to make this a personal venture, a business venture, what have you. So, we are going to start by looking in um, to domain names as linguistic design. And from there, after we talk about names and whether or not you have the right one, we're gonna talk about leveraging it um, for your business, your brand, your personal resume website, um, for reselling, what have you. Before we get started, I do want to take a poll and figure out why you registered a domain name. Um, so if you can go ahead and respond to that, uh, that will really help me to cater this content and make sure that I am getting you the information you need. Um, so we have to go, or if we end up going off script at all, it'll be information that's relevant and pertinent to your needs. Alrighty, right now it looks like we've got a lot of folks who have a desire to start a business or a brand, which is super, super exciting. Um, I'll admit I'm right there along with you. I registered a few domain names at the beginning of the year, um, so I'm in the same boat and I need to get started on that as well. Okay, got about 75% of people who have answered will close this and share the results with you. Um, it looks like, again, most people wanted to start a business or a brand online. A good chunk of you are growing your existing brand or business. Um, so that's really, really exciting. I don't know if maybe you have a brick and mortar or a retail location as is, uh, or perhaps your brand's entirely online and you're just looking to further grow that. If you wanted to throw some extra details about your situation in the chat, um, please feel free. Do be mindful that everyone can see that. Um, so yeah, with this, let's go ahead and dive in. So our agenda today, we're starting with what's in a name. We're going to look at some practical next steps for any domain owner. Um, so we'll get all the necessities out of the way early, and then we're going to get into the really neat and interesting stuff. So what is in a name? Right now, we are going to take a bit of a foray into linguistic design and the sound of names and language in general and how that affects our perception and understanding. And ultimately, how it will affect your branding and your presentation 
in your market with your audience and your customers. Now, all of you that have a domain name, um, please understand that naming is linguistic design and that a good domain name is a pivotal part of your overall site design. And domain names are really gonna fall into two categories. That's gonna be brandable or discoverable. Now, the domain name that you have um, is going to fit into one of these categories based upon what your needs are and what your intention is with your site. A brandable domain name um, is something that's really going to need a little bit more finessing in terms of marketing to create that word of mouth, that buzz. Um, so it may need a little bit more paid and promotional marketing behind it right off the bat. Brandable names are distinctive and they're evocative, they're memorable. Um, examples of these names are a company and a brand we're all familiar with, Apple. Now, when you think about Apple, it's not necessarily the first thing you're gonna think about when you think tech, perhaps in our modern age, but when they were just starting, Apple may have seemed like a pretty big so let's call it a bet or a gamble. Um, but an apple is a very approachable fruit. It's not something that's, you know, covered in layers. You don't have to peel it. It's very approachable. That's how Apple makes their tech. Um, they really, really worked on creating this brandable name because Apple is not something that you would just think of as a normal search term for a computer. Um, and that is really where the distinction comes in between brandable names and discoverable names. Discoverable names are real words and phrases. Uh, the intention behind these sorts of domain names are to rely on and capture organic search traffic. So this might um, be something that is SEO engine. Um, those are two different keywords as compared to Apple. Um, think of a name that you, or think of one of the names of a brand that you're really familiar with and you really love. Would you consider it a discoverable name? Is it full of keywords that maybe somebody who's not familiar with the brand could type into a search engine and land on that page? Or are they more brandable? Um, maybe searching for keywords about the industry, those keywords don't match with the brand name. Um, and that's why you need that extra paid marketing to create those associations. Uh, brandable names create distinct identities. Uh, think of Etsy. Etsy is an online handmade marketplace. Etsy does not mean online handmade marketplace. They had to create that association. Um, so brandable or discoverable, your domain name probably falls in one of those categories and, excuse me, depending on what type of name you have, that will influence your overall strategy and how you take your ultimate brand or business to market. So let's see here. Um, as another example of a brandable name, think of Seth Godin. He is a very prolific blogger, and he has a brand called Squidoo. Squidoo is not a dictionary word. It's not a keyword. It's not something that somebody might necessarily search. Um, but Seth Godin has made it very well known, very recognizable due to his efforts in creating that identity, that distinction, and a fully fleshed out content strategy. So if you are thinking about growing your business or creating a business online, the domain name that you have right now, before you get any further, I really want you to think about what category it falls into. And if it doesn't fall into either of these, maybe it's got a lot of numbers, a lot of hyphens. Um, if it doesn't pass the radio test, which means if someone's just listening to it, could they turn around and spell it and reach your site? Or are your L's actually ones? Are your O's zeros? These types of things don't make for good domain names um, at the most basic level. So please make sure that your domain name falls into one of these categories so that you know how to take it to market and build your brand and your business.
The practical next steps for a domain name really come down to three separate buckets. We're gonna talk about protecting your personal information, simplifying domain management, and really claiming your name, um, you know, planting your flag, and marking out your territory in the market. Starting with protecting your personal information. With any and every domain registration, the personal information of the registrant, either yourself or the business that you represent, it's required to go into the ICANN WHOIS database. ICANN is a nonprofit organization and they, for, um, well, in essence, they manage domain names and the regulations around it. So one of the reasons they require that is because they want a database to indicate who owns what. Um, if you don't know where your information is coming from or who's putting it out into the world, that can lead to some sticky situations. Um, unfortunately, when your information is put into a database like that, there are some bad actors out there who will take advantage of it and they'll scrape your information for their personal use and gain. Maybe that means selling your email address to a bunch of different lists or your mailing address to a bunch of spammy uh, cheap magazines. Either way, um, you can prevent that. Uh, every domain registrar, not just domain.com, offers a variation of domain privacy and protection. That just makes sure your personal information is kept off that database. Um, your registrar's information will be shared with them instead. So, for example, domain.com's contact information would show instead of your personal information. And if there are any legitimate business inquiries, somebody might want to purchase your domain name, talk business, anything like that. Um, the registrar, in this case, domain.com, um, we would kind of act as the middleman and make sure that you get any important communications, anything that is necessary for your business, your brand, but we're going to make sure that all of that spam doesn't get to you. It also includes blacklist monitoring to make sure your domain name doesn't end up uh, blacklisted across any search engines or other internet um, engines, and domain security alerts. So if anyone tries to steal your name out from under your nose. Maybe somehow they got your password because you use the same password across all different things. Um, if somebody goes into your account and they try to make changes that are unauthorized, you will receive domain security alerts so that you can go in and take appropriate action. Um, so that is step number one. Just make sure you have your stuff locked down tight because if this is your business, if this is your brand, um, this is your reputation, it can make or break you online. So please be mindful of it. You're also going to want to think about simplifying domain management. So for the roughly 60% of you that have um, just wanted to start your business, start your brand, you may only have one or two domain names. And management doesn't seem like a big issue. Uh, you can go in, you can renew it, you pay attention to your emails. Um, for those of you who are growing your existing brand or business, you probably have a handful of domains that you are now managing. They could be variations of your primary domain name. Um, they could be misspellings, something like that. Uh, but what have you, you have multiple domain names and they're registered on different dates. You should be renewing them about 15 days before they expire just to give yourself a grace period to make sure nothing bad happens. You've also got all of the other hats you wear as a business owner or contributor to a business. Um, so there's a lot that can happen outside of domain names that can cause you to forget. Now, we do have an auto renewal. Um, auto renewal occurs 15 days prior to expiry. That is just in case any billing information is outdated or incorrect. You have that 15 day buffer to update anything. We would let you know about it. Um, and if that renewal doesn't happen, if you're set to manually renew and you forget, um, you know, forbidding any sort of accident, emergency, um, if your name expires, it will go into a grace period. The grace period is rather short, and at that point, you can work with your registrar to see if that domain can be retrieved. 
Um, if your grace period expires, you haven't noticed that domain name moves into a registrar hold. It can go to an auction or a closeout sale. If the domain isn't sold, then you'll have one more chance at redemption. But at that point, you're going to be paying extra money because you're paying not just for the registration, but you're going to be paying the fees um, for that auction and that attempted sale. If you are not going to redeem it, at that point, your domain name goes through a process of deletion and it is then released back into the general public so anyone can register it. If you've built your business and your brand around a name and that's how people know you, it is a very dangerous thing to have someone else control that name, control that narrative, and really profit off of all of your goodwill and hard work. Um, so domain management, while it may seem a pretty simple thing, it's one of those things that's so vitally important, uh, really shouldn't be overlooked. And finally, we're going to talk about claiming your name. This is really just a way to set the groundwork for the future. Um, this means using your domain to create a custom email address. You can use something like Google Workspace. Um, Google Workspace provides not just productivity tools and business and branding tools, but that custom email, what it gives you far above and beyond all else is legitimacy. It gives credence to your name and your business in your audience and your prospects and your customers' eyes. Instead of emailing JoeBaseball123 at AOLHotmailGmail.com, they're emailing Joe at BaseballTradingCards.com. It just gives a bit more legitimacy and it lends more credence to your business. Um, since so many people are going to be coming across your domain name as the very first exposure to your brand, it's the first thing they're going to have to type into the web bar before they even see your website. Um, associating that name with your email address, with a variety of social handles and tags, whether that be Instagram, on a Facebook business page, um, a TikTok page. The more you can claim your name across different properties, uh, the better your recognition is going to be in market and the more leverage you're going to have. If people aren't thinking about you, if they're not remembering you, they're certainly not going to be talking about you. So you want to claim your name, claim it wherever you can. Um, that also means claiming misspellings and name variations. Let's face it, not all of us are great spellers. Um, if you have a name that could easily be misspelled, think about grabbing those variations too. If you aren't thinking about it, your competitors are going to be thinking about it. Not going to be any skin off their back to register a name and direct it towards their site, especially if you have not gone through the process of attaining a trademark or any other legal protection over your name. Um, and then I really want you to think about the domain name you have and whether or not there are any better names um, out there for your business. And when it comes to that, um, you really want to think about names that have, you know, perhaps indirect connections to your business or your brand's purpose. Um, metaphors are really big. Um, think about Flickr.com. That is a website. I don't know how popular it is now. I know it was very popular with me and my friends about 10 years ago. Um, but Flickr.com, that name, uh, F-L-I-C-K-R.com, it relates to photography using the concept of light that is implicit in the word Flickr. So you don't always have to be very obvious in using the most descriptive name, associations and metaphors are really great too. You can think about compound domain names uh, like YouTube. Um, compound names are two whole words. They're often nouns um, that are put together. And please don't let people tell you that this is you know, a passing fad or a trend. Um, compound words are naturally occurring across languages all over the world and have been for time immemorial. 
Um, so compound names aren't going anywhere. You can also think about uh, phrases. Um, phrases are kind of similar to compounds, but the difference is in the emphasis on the syllables. So think about white in the White House. Um, that would be the compound word, White House. In a phrase, that would be the White House. Um, that emphasis is on the end instead. So be mindful of the sound of words and the sound of names. Um, you could blend two words together. Think about Microsoft. Um, that combines micro from microcomputer and soft from software. So a lot of blended names um, work really well, but sometimes they can be a bit awkward. So think about a name like Mapufacture or Carticipate, a um, couple of different brand names that don't necessarily roll off the tongue so easily. Uh, there are a lot of sharp sounds, could be a C, could be a K. Um, think about how it sounds, think about how people will react to listening to it. Um, if you have a business that has to do with counseling and you have a lot of clients and you need to build trust, uh, think about a name that has maybe more soft and rounded sounds to it with B from B, D, the sound of the letter D, instead of sharp sounds like T for the, the letter T or K for the letter K. Um, and the reason for that is because across the world, across a variety of different cultures, people have associations with sound. If you were to take uh, two different words, kiki and maluma, those are two made up words. An experiment was done a while back and those two words were presented to different groups of people. And they asked those people, if one of these words were to be symbolized, which one would be sharp and which would be round? And overwhelmingly, across a, different, uh, a difference of linguistic backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, people assumed that kiki was a sharp word and maluma was the round word or soft. Um, soft and sharp, those are also words that can be used to describe a brand, a personality. Um, so just think about the way these things come off as married as you might be to the name you have right now, um, as much as you may have invested in what you think is the best name ever, uh, it's not about you, unfortunately. Um, it's about audience and perception. Uh, it's about memorability. It's about what you evoke in someone else. Um, so claim your name, claim the right name, um, and you can really make some waves in your market. Okay, so now that we get the practical things out of the way, uh, let's talk about how to vet this idea that you've had because all of your domain names, your plans for the future, it all stems from an idea. And we're gonna talk about um, not just the elements of a good idea, but how to take that and then grow it. So, for it to be a good idea for a brand or a business, there needs to be some sort of interest or demand. Now, it can be incredibly niche, but if that is the case, you do have to accept that your market may be smaller and that puts limitations on growth. So doing a little bit of market research um, really behooves you and sets you up for success in the long run. You can gauge market demand using surveys, uh, online forums, um, when you're really gauging interest and demand, now might not be the time to ask friends and family unless you can be sure that those friends and family are going to give you the unadulterated and unfiltered truth. Not saying you need to be rude about your idea, but you want someone who is going to be accurate in their assessment and in their evaluation, not somebody who might be putting uh, your feelings first. Um, because ultimately that's not what's going to make your business or your brand succeed. Um, 
practically speaking, uh, feelings just aren't going to cut it when you're trying to determine market research. So you want to go out there, you want to look for data, for facts, for figures, um, and really see if you can identify any trends or patterns. Um, and, you know, I do want to take a step back and say one thing. Um, if this is something that you feel you might be uncomfortable with or you don't really know how to get started, it's always okay to seek outside help. Um, you can go to different organizations. You can reach out on LinkedIn to somebody in the industry that you look up to. Um, but if this is a little intimidating or maybe doesn't play to your strengths, make connections, network, figure out how to get the information you need because we want to see you succeed. You want to succeed, um, and this is all necessary for that. You also want to be very clear in setting short and long-term goals. Um, detailed plans are crucial to success, and they not just set the intentions and framework for what you need to do, um, but they'll hold you accountable. And one of the ways to do that is to use SMART goals. Now. Um, if you've heard this before, you know, uh, it bears repeating. Um, SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, or realistic, and they are time bound. So I could say, my goal is to start a new business. That's great. That's a fantastic goal. That tells me or you absolutely nothing about how you're going to achieve it what tools or practices need to be implemented to get it done. Um, doesn't even say I'm gonna get it done in this decade. I could be waiting another 20 years and that goal would still be relevant. Um, so yeah, we're gonna skip those. We're gonna go and look at SMART goals and we're going to parse out what it is we need to do. A better SMART goal would be, I am going to start a consulting business and I am going to do that within the next six months. And I am going to measure success by having my planning done at that time increment or time interval. So your goals don't have to comprise the entire thing. Break them down into smaller, more manageable pieces. Um, give yourself a reason to be accountable and really set expectations, set intentions. Um, they really can change your day, change your week, change your life. Um, so don't, 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 don't discount the power of a good goal. Also, as much as you may want to restrict yourself to the plan and the tactics that you set out at the beginning for achieving your goal, you have to be a little realistic and realize that not everything is necessarily black and white. You might have to be a little bit flexible. As you take your concept, your idea to market, you start building your brand, you start building your business, um, now is the time that you really wanna open your ears to feedback. That can be from friends, that can be from family, but it can also be from customers, uh, prospects, um, you know, leave a, leave a form, leave a survey on your site pin a post to the top of your social media account, asking people to, you know, be candid with you and let them know how much you appreciate and value that feedback. Um, that flexibility and that change can also be driven due to market volatility, changing trends. Um, so many different things can affect the course of an idea of a business. Um, so don't be intractable, maintain a bit of flexibility without losing sight of your goals. Um, your good idea, if it is a good idea, uh, there has to be some kind of long-term vision there. It doesn't necessarily need to be tied to something you love. Um, if your hobby is, you know, bicycles and working on them, and maybe it's going to lead into a different career path, you think, and you really want to go with it, um, that's great. You absolutely can, but it doesn't need to be tied to something you love. You just have to have enough interest in it to keep yourself engaged, motivated, and in pursuit of your goals. 
Um, depending on who you ask, some people will also say that turning your passion project into your business is a bad idea. Um, business and pleasure don't always mix. But again, that does come down to the individual. If it's something you're willing and able to do, by all means, pursue it. Um, but don't get caught up in the hype that you have to absolutely love what you do every single day. Um, what you have to do is you have to strive towards that. Absolutely. Um, but don't beat yourself up if it's not happening or if you really don't find something you absolutely love, but you still have that drive and you have that passion to create that brand and create that business. Um, we also want to talk about growing that idea. Seeing it take flight, seeing it succeed, that feels good. <laughs> um, all of us, every single one of us, uh, loves a good success, loves a good win. So to grow your idea, be open to inspiration. Uh, don't get lost in, you know, a feedback loop with the same people. Um, expose yourself to new ideas. Expose yourself to new theories. You know, it's not always a bad thing to expand your horizons. You never know when the muse is going to be sitting on your shoulder and inspiration will strike. Um, be open to that feedback. Feedback is a gift. Uh, people do not have to take the time out of their day to tell you what they think of you. If they are, it's because they care. If somebody does not care, they do not do something. Um, so even if it's not the feedback you want to hear, thank them for it. Because the worst thing that can happen is people stop giving you feedback. They stop telling you what they've observed, what they've noticed. And sometimes we're really blind to ourselves. We're really blind to our business, to our brands, um, because we can get so caught up in it. So be mindful of that. You also want to strike a balance between creative and critical thinking. Um, some of us are the more artsy types. Some of us are logicians. Some of us are philosophers, somewhere in between. Um, and you're going to have to learn how to strike that balance. And one way to do it is divergent and convergent thinking. So divergent thinking is really where the creative comes into mind. This is where you're allowed to banter and play around with words, play with ideas. Don't get locked into black and white. Um, this is where all different shades of gray exist. And then convergent thinking is where you take those creative ideas and you really start to apply strategy to it. You start thinking through, okay, now that I've come up with this idea, how can I realize it? What are the practical implications? What are the ramifications? Um, so it's a completely different approach to thinking. And divergent and convergent um, thinking, it's, they're both incredibly necessary to the process. Um, if you find that maybe you lean more towards the rational, logical thinking, and you really struggle with the creative thinking, find someone you trust, whether that be a friend, acquaintance, business partner, or uh, invest a little bit of money and find a consultant. Um, let them balance you out, feed off of each other. Uh, none of us can really go at this alone. And then we're going to talk about analysis, just making sure that you've identified different key performance indicators and metrics um, so you can gauge whether or not your idea is succeeding and let you know how to move on from there. Um, so, yeah, growing your idea is an exciting part. Again, there's so much potential here. It's up to you how to realize it. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that and get into the nitty gritty with our next slides. So brand protection. Um, this one is a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, brand protection is planning for your future. So brand protection is the process of safeguarding your intellectual property. Why does that matter? Because it prevents brand abuse. Brand abuse is an umbrella term. It refers to third parties infringing on existing brands to take advantage of reputation, cause harm, or loss in market value. Um, really, brand abuse is anyone who isn't associated with your brand that has ill will and is acting upon that um, to your detriment. In practice, it could be copyright piracy, trademark squatting, patent theft, 
uh, online impersonation, and so much more. Um, why worry about it now if you don't have an established business or brand? Because as you succeed, there are going to be some people who get jealous. There are going to be people who want to piggyback off of that. And it's going to become a problem if you do not put the protections and safeguards against it now. Um, now, I am not a lawyer, and this is not legal advice. But if you can, please take the time to look into registering your IP, your intellectual property. Um, if it meets the requirements, get a trademark. The more defensive brand protection strategies you implement now, the less you have to worry about offense in the future. Um, an offensive strategy implies that somebody's already attacking you, already damaging you. Um, make it so that they can't do that from the get-go. And you also want to continue to build. This harkens back to what we spoke to a little while ago. Get your social media handles in order, um, even if you don't necessarily use the platform. Because you don't have to be on every social media platform. You just have to be where your prospects, your customers, uh, your audiences. If they are on Instagram and not on Reddit, you have no need to be on Reddit. But you don't want someone on Reddit who is pretending to be you either. So lock down your name, claim your name. Um, that presence that permeates social media, that permeates the online world is going to create more authority for your brand and for your legitimate business. And this is the fun part for me, at least. I'm talking a little bit more about the elements of online branding. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because there's a lot here. Uh, but again, if this is anything that you want to learn more about, use the chat option. Let me know. I am so happy um, and would be more than happy to dive into any of these topics in further detail. So elements of online branding. Um, your brand is any and every touch point a consumer has with you. So that means a customer service interaction. That means the people you have representing you. That means really bad website design that lags and poor navigation, um, poorly designed menus. All of those things affect how somebody's going to think about your brand um, because they don't leave them feeling very good. It's also your color palette. Um, it's color theory, what these different colors evoke. Um, unlike the sound symbolism, what I was talking about with the kikis and the malumas, the sharps and the rounds, uh, color theory is not universal. Um, for example, in some Western cultures, it would be considered incredibly disrespectful to wear black to a funeral, in, or excuse me, in some Eastern cultures. In some Western cultures, it would be considered disrespectful to wear white to a funeral. Um, so be mindful of that. Know where your audience is and do your due diligence in understanding them. Um, typography and fonts affect how people think of you. Um, make sure above all else that you maintain legibility because no matter what it is, if people can't read your message, they can't read the font that you're using, you're not going to build connections with them. It'll frustrate them and you've lost that opportunity. Um, be mindful of your web design, of that user experience, like I mentioned. Um, and a few other things to be mindful of. Uh, photography can support a consistent and cohesive style, whether it's black and white photography or that Thomas Kincaid painting effect where there happens to be some kind of magical light source from every single angle. Um, if that's the approach you want to take to photography, so be it. But make sure that it's consistent, make it cohesive, so that anyone who sees it knows it's you. Um, icons, those go hand in hand with design. Um, make sure that they're consistent. Again, um, consistency sets us 
excuse me, consistency really sets expectations for your site visitors and the people who are learning your brand as you're building it. Um, illustration, video, this all leads into that same sort of idea. Uh, white space is important um, because sometimes it's not about what you can add, but about what you leave. So don't be afraid of white space. Don't crowd your content. Let things breathe. Um, what you're doing, if your idea is good, if you vetted it, it deserves its space. Let it own its space so that your ideas, your products, your listings, your blog posts aren't crowded and people aren't getting lost. Um, your voice and your tone is going to inform every piece of messaging you have. So is it first person or third? Is it professional, human, sarcastic? Um, it doesn't have to be the same across all communications either. So you're allowed to be more casual on social media and that's okay. It's not a legal document. Um, you aren't, you know, creating a historical repository, anything like that. Um, and professional communications, unless you're absolutely positive it's a relaxed environment, um, build in some guidelines for what your voice and tone might look like then. And diction. Diction, what words do you use to express yourself in your brand? Are you good? Are you great? Radiant? All of these things have positive connotations, but it's the nuances between the words and the way people think of them um, that can subconsciously lead or detract from your brand. And then your content structure. We're going to dive into this as we jump into talking about website blog creation, um, but content structure absolutely informs as well. So your next steps in your food for thought when you're creating a website or a blog because you are building your brand, you're growing your business online. Here's what to take into account when you're planning and creating. Uh, first things first, your purpose and your goals need to be determined. Is the purpose of the site you're creating to maintain a blog? Is communication the primary goal here? Is it e-commerce? Are you selling services or products to either the customers at large all over the internet, or is it going to be gated? Do you have a very selective clientele who need to interact with you? Um, are you just showcasing your portfolio or your resume? Um, in that case, it doesn't need to be a 20 page site, does it? You could probably suffice with a three pager. One that has your about information in a contact form, one that has the details of your uh, CV or your resume, and maybe another page that imports photos from social media or a portfolio of your work, um, some examples that you can show to prospective employers or business partners. Um, Whatever your blog purpose is, that's going to really lead and define the requirements. The requirements you come up with are going to inform your design, and that design breeds creation. Um, so your site requirements. First things first, honesty and realism are so very important. Do you have the time and the know-how to dedicate to building a site? That means the planning, that means the research, that means the maintenance. Um, and even if you are incredibly knowledgeable and there's you know, no reason that you can't learn, do you have the time for it? A lot of people who are starting out or growing an existing business wear a lot of hats. Um, so do you need help with certain areas on an ad hoc, case by case basis with the entirety of the project? Do you want to hire a professional? Um, will something like a website builder suffice? Website builders are often called WYSIWYGs. What you see is what you get with a lot of drag and drop elements. Um, they can create very functional, excuse me, very functional, very beautiful sites. Um, so think about your purpose, think about your time restraints, and think about you know, where your wheelhouse is and what you might need some help with. 
Um, there's also WordPress, but that does require more technical knowledge. Think about the number of site pages, because that could also influence whether you're building something from scratch or you're using a website builder template that might offer fewer pages. Or if you have that e-commerce purpose, um, then you could look for a website builder that offers templates for store listings. You want to think about your site storage. All of that content, all those images, all those listings, they take up space. Um, so you need that site storage. Uh, the devil's in the details. Don't forget. Are you going to need a dedicated content management system or CMS for blogging like WordPress? Do you need online forms because you're collecting feedback, uh, click to email functionality, maps or slideshows? Um, really think through the different pages and how you want somebody to interact with them. Um, you want a comprehensive online presence, so make sure you're linking <laughs> Uh, or integrating to your different social media accounts or any other digital properties you might have. Uh, device optimization. People aren't just on laptops or desktops. They peruse the internet from tablets, from their cell phones, and you wanna make sure that your website is responsive uh, so that if they're looking at it on their cell phone, everything is easy to navigate, the design is good, uh, the user experience is good, um, and it's not as though they're trying to navigate an awkward desktop site on a mobile phone. Also think about site security, uh, SSL. Um, that's what is the HTTPS that you see in a browser bar before the domain name that indicates that any information that's being transferred, like personal information, if someone's making a purchase from you, is encrypted. Uh, so if anyone intercepts that, it's going to look like a whole bunch of gibberish. Um, Firewall and malware removal, that's going to be a more manual process. If you decide to do it yourself, you can offload it by purchasing different things. Um, SiteLock is a great tool. Um, you can think of SiteLock as, you know, you would a building manager. If you're renting an apartment, it is the building manager's responsibility to make sure that maintenance is taken care of, that their lights are kept on outside, uh, trash is removed from the premises, um, but it's not their job to make sure that your front door is locked. Um, so if you're using a shared hosting and it's not a private hosting, uh, think about SSL because as much as your host is going to have their end of things locked down, um, your individual site could be insecure without it. And you wanna design with SEO in mind. SEO is search engine optimization. It makes sure your site and your content uh, are discovered on the search engine result pages. Um, comprehensive strategies include tactics for on-page, off-page, technical, other SEO elements. Uh, you wanna be able to measure your success. How do you know if your site's meeting its goals? Do you have sales goals? Do you have goals for online visitor traffic? Um, KPI stands for Key Performance Indicator. Determine what those are for you and your brand, you and your business, and what metrics you're gonna use for analysis and don't forget to analyze. Um, knowing where you stand helps inform how you grow and decisions for the future. And really just leave yourself room to grow. Uh, don't get overly restrictive with a hosting package or something like that if you plan on having, you know, ultimately thousands and thousands, millions of people visiting your site. Um, you don't want them not being able to reach it because of traffic and bandwidth. So plan for the future. Uh, think big, um, have a little faith in yourself, because if you're putting the time and the energy into it, if you have that market and a well thought out idea and a plan to take it to market, um, you really should see some success. And now finally, we're going to talk about domaining. So this has to do with domain resells. If you purchase that domain with the intent to make a profit off of it. Um, domaining is what we in the industry like to call it, although the um, more formal industry term is domain name speculation or domain name investing. Uh, it's just the practice of identifying, registering, and investing in these domains uh, with the intention or the goal of reselling them for a profit. Um, is it profitable? <laughs> 
You know, not everything we purchase is profitable. Think about Beanie Babies. There was a lot of hype there. Not much came out of it. Um, so domaining absolutely, absolutely can be profitable. But it's not going to be super easy. It has to be thoughtful and you have to be mindful of what you're doing. Um, there is risk involved, just as with any investment. So you'll need to carefully consider all of the opportunities. Um, if you're thinking about getting started, you have the option to do so with a primary market domain speculation. So this means registering a domain name for the first time. It could be difficult to get a really good domain that somebody else is going to want uh, because a lot of one word, three letter, four letter domains have already been registered and they have been for years. These domains can sell for millions of dollars. Um, so it's going to be harder to find unless you start looking at new domain extensions, considering .xyz, .yoga, uh, .me, .co, .online. Many big brands are really adopting these different TLDs and domain extensions because they can be so incredibly and hyper relevant to your market, to your audience. Um, so don't discount that. If you're thinking about reselling domain names, look at the opportunity, see where there's a little bit more, um, because if you identify the diamonds in those sea of domain names, you can really make good returns on it. The other option is the aftermarket. Um, this is purchasing premium domains. So these are domains that have already been registered. Somebody else currently owns it. Um, and these domains tend to be more expensive because they're the one word dot coms, dot nets, dot orgs. Uh, you are paying for the discoverability, you might be paying for brandability, you're paying for the memorability. Uh, some of these domains even have um, historical information. They used to get a lot of traffic. Maybe it's a single word and someone types it into the browser and instead of getting Google results, they land on this website associated with that domain. Um, so there is a lot of potential with premium names, uh, especially reselling. Um, but you are going to want to think about the budget you have, what the cost of these names are, the cost of renewals and maintenance, because there's no saying that somebody's going to buy it tomorrow. Um, premium names tend to have more niche markets. They have fewer people who would be interested because they're so highly specific. But do not get that confused with value. Just because it may not have a giant audience of interest, that in no way equates to less value. They're incredibly valuable. Um, and cyber squatting. Everyone wants, wants to know if domain investing is cyber squatting. No, when it's done properly, it's not. Um, cyber squatting has to do with somebody does this in bad faith. So they are doing it with the intention of profiting off of somebody's trademark. Anyone who is doing this legitimately as a domain speculator, as a domainer, as an investor, they are avoiding registering anything that's trademarked and they're doing their due diligence just like you should before registering a name to make sure there's no existing trademark um, because you do not want to see yourself taken to court for that name um, or any other negative outcome.